just by way of introduction, I'm a Pomo Coast Miwok Indian from Northern California. I'm an enrolled member at the Great Rancheria, where my aunt, who is 85 years old, still serves on the Tribal Council. Uh, so she's our, our family representative. What I want to do this morning with BJ's help is to walk you through the history of how we got to ICWA and then what it looks like around the country and then talk a little bit about the fact that ICWA really is best practice. I've been talking with states around the country about the fact that they ought to be treating all of their kids like ICWA cases. They shouldn't be thinking of ICWA as something special just for Indian kids, but this really is best practice for all kids, and that's why they ought to follow ICWA. It's been the law for 35 years, and we're still having trouble getting them to follow it, but if we can convince them that this is really best for everybody, including Indian kids, then hopefully we'll make some progress. 1879, the Carlisle Indian Boarding School was founded. It was the first of the boarding schools. And it was founded as a military boarding school model. The hallmark of these schools for the first 40 years they were in existence were the cemeteries that were attached to them. Because over half of the kids who went to these schools during those first 40 years died at these schools. In the museum at Haskell, there's a set of handcuffs. You can see the size of those handcuffs. Can you imagine the, the thought process that goes behind thinking that you need to create handcuffs of that size? So let's jump from what happened 150 years ago to 50 years ago. 1958, the Indian Adoption Project was created. And this was a joint effort of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Child Welfare League of America. And we know about this because CWLA has issued a written apology for what happened. In the 1950s, CWLA was the cutting edge thinking, the most progressive ideas about how to properly raise children. They were the go-to people for how to take care of children. They got together with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to create the Indian Adoption Project. And the project had as its goal the placement of Indian children taken from homes that were, quote, deemed unsuitable. What happened was that the states were actually paid by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to remove Indian children under the rubric of neglect. CWLA did not do all of those removals, but they were the pilot program. They were the ones who provided the theoretical underpinnings, the justification for doing it. But states were actually paid by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to remove kids under the rubric of neglect. Transracial placements were encouraged because the goal was to get those kids away from their families and away from their communities put them in a white home where they then had a chance at a modern life. During this time period, 25 to 35 percent of all Indian children in the country were removed from their families. So let's jump from 50 years ago to 30 years ago. One of the last comprehensive looks at life in Indian country was done by the U.S. Congress when they created the American Indian Policy Review Commission. And the stories that you all heard yesterday, if you go back and read the transcripts from the hearings of the American Indian Policy Review Commission, the stories are almost the same. It's almost eerily the same. They did their study in the 
mid-1970s, the report was issued in 1977. Not coincidentally, the very year before ICWA was passed, ICWA was passed the very next year with almost no dissent in Congress. When I was on the Pew Commission on Children in Foster Care, we made a series of recommendations for national policy and for state policy. One of the things we recommended was that the judges who make these decisions actually sit down and talk with workers, with therapists, with service providers, with administrators, with lawyers, not about an individual case, but about how to make the system better. I made that presentation to one group of judges, and they said, absolutely, that's what we want to do. They decided to meet together. A year and a half later, they invited me back. If I'd had any hair left, I would have been pulling it out over what they were talking about. Because they were upset at a police officer. A police officer had arrested mom 2 o'clock on a Friday night. They're upset because grandma lived around the block. And he let the little kids, three, five, and seven, go home with grandma instead of putting them in a shelter. They had no concern about grandma not being safe. Their concern was that those children might not then qualify for 4E, federal funding, because it might not be a licensed initial placement which would disqualify the children for funding. And so they wanted the children to go to a shelter instead of with grandma. And I'm going, we've lost our way here. The money is driving the system instead of our concern for kids. Those kids absolutely needed to be with grandma. That was the best choice. But then I had to tell them, okay, if you want to follow the money, if your concern is so much for the money, why couldn't you at least put a cot in the shelter next to the kid's bed so grandma could be there? It's the children's sense that they don't need to be hypervigilant anymore. They can surrender that responsibility to somebody they know, not to a stranger, to somebody they know, somebody they have a relationship with. That's family. That's what was necessary. Western science has finally gotten around to the place that tribal people have known for a long time. Relationships, family, are what are essential for healthy children to grow. What's happened, though, is Western science is up here. Tribal traditions are over here. And social work practices here in the middle, and they haven't made it to either way. So we have people who think they're helping kids, removing them into institutions or stranger care because it's already licensed. And what we're actually doing is we're hurting kids in the name of helping. In this country, 4E, which is almost a $6 billion pot of money, drives our social service system. The states get almost 60 cents on every dollar spent on social services for families reimbursed by the federal government through various funding mechanisms. But the biggest is 4E. But the hook with 4E is the feds only pay if the child has been removed from home. They don't pay to keep the child at home and help the family get better. They don't pay to keep that child in place. They pay only after removal. So when administrators start to build service programs, they build programs around where they can get funding. And they can get over half of the cost reimbursed by the feds if the program is built around removal. So counseling for the kids, counseling for the parents is available after removal in most places in the country because that's where the services have been built. 
I know a lot of my colleagues who remove kids from their homes thinking that's the best way to get them the services and the help they need. Instead of asking, what can we provide to those children while they're still home that can help fix the problem? We have built a series of institutions now designed around removal of children as the first option. But it's an option that harms kids. I mean, that's what that basic research tells us. Kids are much better with people they know, with families and situations they know. And the more you stress the kid, the more brain damage you're going to end up incurring. We need to rethink how we do social services. Well, one expert came to us at the Pew Commission and told us that 60%, 6-0, of the kids who age out of foster care will be homeless, in jail, or dead within two years of leaving the system. That's not success to me. That's when I have to ask myself, if we did nothing, would they be worse off? When we take kids, we don't try and heal. We simply take them as the intervention. WestJet published a bulletin in January of last year where they did their own study, and they said that within two to four years, children aging out of foster care, over half were unemployed, 25% were homeless, and 20% were incarcerated. I think it's White Earth in Minnesota does what's called customary adoptions, where if moms are drugging and dads in prison and you need new parents, they bring in new parents, but they don't terminate the old ones. So that child keeps their grandparents, keeps their cousins, keeps their brothers and sisters. And the extended family basically adopts these new parents. But even the parents keep rights and relationships with the child. You just have a new set of parents who are responsible for the day-to-day -day care. The disruption rate for adoptions out of foster care, generally, the numbers range between about 25% and 50%, depending on which study you look at. The disruption rate for the 10 years that White Earth has been doing these customary adoptions is 1%. Shouldn't we look at doing something different? where we can keep the kids connected. Clearly there are children who ought not be at their home. There's a sexual predator there. It's a meth lab. They shouldn't be there. But that doesn't mean that they have to lose all the connections to all of their family. Because we're really talking about not punishing the parents. We're talking about doing what's best for the children. One of the things that I've, I ask judges to do when I talk to them is to look at the case through the eyes of the child. When you're standing on top of a mountain and you're looking in the valley, the valley looks very different than when you're standing in the middle of the valley looking around. Reality hasn't changed. It's just what you see has changed. If we were to look at our system through the eyes of the child, we would probably not be very happy with what they see. South Dakota is one of the higher rates of disproportionate removal of native children, about four times more likely for a native child to be removed, according to that National Council on Juvenile and Family Judges report. But it's not the worst. Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Washington, Idaho have worse statistics. South Dakota, though, has one of the lowest rates of compliance with the foster care placement preferences of ICWA. Only about 10% of native children 
are placed into homes consistent with Section 1915 of ICWA. Only 10 percent. That's a really that's the biggest violation right there of the Indian Child Welfare Act in South Dakota and other states. ICWA says place with extended family members, members of the child's tribe, li licensed facilities, licensed by the tribe, other Indian families. We're not complying with that. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about as we go along. Why are we not complying with that? Now, we want your interaction, your ideas also, because it's one of the more confounding problems we face in South Dakota. But I do know for a fact that Indian tribes that run their own foster care systems were able to place more than 80% of Indian kids with Indian families. Why? Why if we, using the same regulations as the state, why we're able to achieve 80% compliance with this goal while the state is only achieving 10%? Maybe we're doing something that the state can learn from. I know one thing we do at Sisson Wapitan is we always encourage family members to get involved before the government does. Why should the government take a child when there's a loving, responsible, extended family member, grandma, auntie, uncle, who can step in and take the child? There's always, I would venture to say, there's always a family member that's willing to step up. And the thing we all know is in these families, these family members know that this parent sometimes is not raising this child correctly. But the state law, the state system does not give grandma the chance to go in, file a petition, and get emergency custody. Because in South Dakota, the South Dakota Supreme Court has said ICWA applies to grandparent guardianship petitions. So grandma, to get custody in South Dakota, is going to have to show I provided active efforts, uh, get a qualified expert witness. So how can we in the tribal system help get these kids out of DSS care, avoid their placement in DSS care. Another fact about South Dakota. South Dakota, with respect to Native people, is probably the poorest, poorest area in the country. We have the poorest urban areas for Native people. We have the poorest reservations. That's not to say that poor people don't do a good job raising their kids. But poor people face obstacles in the justice system that others don't. I know for a fact, one of the big contributing factors to the removal of a lot of Native children in South Dakota is parents who don't have driver's licenses, who have warrants because they haven't paid fines, they haven't paid attorney's fees, who get stopped by the police. How many of you know young Native mothers who are afraid to drive off the reservation because they're fearful they're going to be stopped by the police? I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. They're fearful of law enforcement stopping them. Why? They don't have a license. If they're driving on revoked license, if they have an old fine for fines and costs or for non-payment of attorney's fees, they get arrested, their children go into the system. So we can't, that's a, mo, that is a commonplace fear that young Native parents have. And we've got to recognize it. Have you ever been into state court in Mobridge, Sisseton, White River, Martin? Who are they parading in in those orange jumpsuits? Donald Trump's not coming in. It's Native people, right? Young Native people. And increasingly, young Native women. There's a lot of statistics showing that the biggest increase in the incarceration rate in this country is Native women. So that's a dynamic that contributes to natives, Native children going into the foster care system. Native persons in South Dakota are also more likely to be incarcerated, be revoked on probation or parole, and be subjected to pretrial detention. 
Kids think we're superhuman. They don't understand when we fail them. When they're taken into the system, they wonder, where's Grandma? Why isn't she here? Why isn't she in her robe flying in here to help me? And uh, I feel for these little ones. When they don't really understand the system, what's going on, what the dynamics are. Another thing that's happening in South Dakota and also in other states, because we do have high poverty rates amongst Native people, po people in poverty are more subject to governmental scrutiny, right? If we had a system that we're just trying to protect kids, we're not using child protection as a way of punishing people, what could happen Monday morning if mom, let's say mom got arrested, she had an old warrant, she cleared the warrant, she's out of jail Monday morning. What may happen? What should happen? Okay. Why not put the kids back, right? Is that what happens? What happens? Yeah, you know, well, you know, we got some calls on that house a couple years ago. Uh, probably different people live there, but we got calls on that house. We got to look into this more. There's a, there's a tendency, I think, in the child protection system to think, eh, if this happened once, it's probably been happening a lot. So we may be remiss, we may be negligent just to return the kids. Let's look into it a little more. Maybe let's keep custody with DSS for 60 days. Let's try to help these parents so we don't have any more house parties. Is, does that happen or am I just making this up? Anybody? Is that what happens? Then after 60 days, what's the issue? People kind of forget about the house party and it's more, well, what have you done? Did you go to get your eval? Did you get your parental capacity assessment? Have you done your one hour supervised visitation a week? Never mind the fact you may have lost your only source of income by losing TANF when the kids are removed from you, right? You don't have a driver's license. It's 20 below zero. The issue doesn't become, is, that is it safe to return the child? The issue becomes, how's that case service plan coming along for you? Oh, you haven't fulfilled that yet? We're going to give you 60 more days. So I know in the tribal system we will criticize, and we're entitled to criticize what happens to Native children. We got to watch what we're doing too. If we just emulate the state practices that we saw, what are we doing better? What are we doing better? We got to do better, right? We got to do better for these kids.